Thank you for those good songs, Paul. They fit very well with our lesson tonight. I ask if you would to open your Bibles at this time to the book of Colossians. We're going to conclude the series I've begun on Sunday morning. We'll start a new series next Sunday morning. So we're moving Sunday morning's sermons. We got about 18, 20 verses left to go in the book of Colossians. So if you'll be there at chapter 3, beginning in verse 18 tonight, we're still talking about the leavening of Christ's supremacy in our life. And for those that were here on Sunday mornings that aren't on Sunday night, they're going to miss this vital lesson dealing with a very important topic. I want you to look at verse 18 uh, down through verse 25, and I'm going to hit just uh, briefly what we've talked about in the last few weeks. Verse 18 deals with wives. Verse 19 deals with husbands. Uh, verse 20 deals with children being obedient to parents. Verse 4 deals with fathers, which I think would be uh, understandable that it would be fathers and mothers. Do not exasperate your children that they may not lose heart. And then tonight we're in verse 22. The Bible says in Colossians 3 verse 22, Slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing or respecting the Lord. And then verse 23, Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. And then I think the writers that put the verses and the chapters together made a mistake, and they should have included chapter 4, verse 1 in the section that we just read, so I want to read that. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. You see how that flows right with the same thought as verse 24 and 5 about working in the Lord and the consequences and not showing partiality. Then he addresses the subject of masters granting to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Well, I want to suggest tonight, we're not going to be here very long, but the leavening of your daily job. You know, here we are at the beginning of a new year. We think about our responsibilities. We all kind of take a deep breath and we launch out into this new year, 2024. And these verses address us as people who are workers. And the leavening of our Savior does not stop just when we leave our job and go home. There's leavening of the supremacy of Christ even while we're workers out in the world doing things for a boss. And so this leavening goes further than just what we do at home. These earlier verses that we looked at, it would be understandable that we could all apply those to what happens in the family unit. But now we're talking about those that are working in their daily position, whatever that might be. And so Paul shows us that the influence that the Savior has upon us goes even into our jobs and who we are and what we're doing. Whether we are in management or if we're laborers, we're all going to be affected by the way a Christian man or woman looks at their position in life and how they're working. And so to the employees, Paul says their attitude and your actions in work will be changed. Because you are a Christian, you're going to look at your job, you're going to look at your profession in a different way now that Jesus is Lord. Now that Jesus is supreme in your life, it carries through into every facet of who we are, and particularly with our work. And there are other references in the New Testament that I want to spend a little time on tonight. I don't have the time to break every single verse down because they're too numerous. But I want to read some of them tonight that have to do with how we work and how we are as laborers in our job, in our position. The book of 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4 verse 11 tells us these words. And to make it your ambition to live a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands 
just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. So obviously in Thessalonica, Paul saw something that he needed to address with the church. And he said, you make it your ambition to live a quiet, someone, another verse may say tranquil life, to live a quiet life and attend to your own business. And you work with your own hands. Now, I want to just stop right here and tell you, this is a problem in America today. We have many people who want to ride on the train, but they don't want to do their work. We have a nation that has got it backwards today where we need to be working and be profitable because you know why? It makes a man, it makes a woman feel better when we're doing something with our hands. But when you have no ambition in life, you don't care about very much. All you want is more of what you can't have. And so the Bible says, if a man does not work, let him not what? Eat. Now, we like that passage because we feel superior because we're working. But let me tell you, some people just have a bad stretch in their life. And so we always need to be reminding ourselves that sometimes things happen to people. Sometimes people get laid off just at the beginning of the year or at the end of the year. This happened to one of our families here in this congregation. And so are we going to point at him and say, oh, you're not working so you don't eat. Listen, he didn't ask to get laid off. That's corporate America today. These things happen. And so we have an empathy, we have a sympathy, and we are patient with people like that. But when someone says they don't want a quiet and tranquil life, that they want to go willy-nilly and do everything that they can and just receive more on the dole, that's not being a worker using your hands. And so we will behave properly, and we're going to do that toward outsiders, and we're going to be people that try not to have any need. We're going to do what we need to do as human beings, working with our hands. The second letter that Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians, if you'll turn that to chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, we find these words. For even when, you, when we were with you, let me start that over. For even when we were with you, Paul says, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like, listen to this, busy bodies. Do I have to explain what a busy body is? A busy body is someone who goes around taking care of everybody else's business except for theirs. Busy, busy, busy. Just flying around, getting their nose in everyone's business, except taking care of their own backyard, as we oftentimes say. He says here, for we hear. Could that be true of today in the country in which we live in? We hear of some people who are not doing these things. And some are leading undisciplined lives. We don't have to look very far down the pike. Turn on the news tonight, turn on the radio, read the news. Does anybody read the newspaper anymore? I don't know. You read the newspaper, you see things, and you see where people are living undisciplined lives. They have no idea what it means to have a structure to their life. And so as Christians, we ought to be opposite of those things. We ought not to have our nose in everybody else's business. We ought to be taking care of work with our own hands, putting our own nose to the grindstone, working daily, and doing it for who? For the Lord. Working as people for and to the Lord. Spending their time, stirring up trouble. Paul said, settle down. Quit being a busybody and taking care of everybody else's business and not taking care of your own. And then Paul said this to the church in Ephesus. Open your Bible there to chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 and 9. 5 through 9. He says, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by ways of eye service as men-pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. With a good will, render service 
as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, either slave or free. And masters, verse 9, do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. I used to work in a warehouse when I was in high school. We had a Maxwell House coffee chain where we sold huge boxes of coffee to restaurants and institutional businesses. We sold large cases of canned goods of food and all kinds of paper products. And sometimes in the summer, it was really hot in that warehouse. We had just a few fans blowing around to keep the temperature as comfortable as possible, but you still work up a sweat and you work hard. And sometimes some of the guys in the office would just get lazy. But when the, when the boss would come out the door and come out on the floor, oh, you should have seen everybody scatter. They got up and they started acting like they were busy. Give me that dolly. I've got to go get this. I've got to load this on the truck. And they got busy. But guess what happened when the boss shut the door again? Right back to sitting down, smoking a cigarette on the company time, doing everything they wanted to do except for work. You see, he says here that we ought to be obedient to our masters, not just eye pleasers. You ever known someone that's just an eye pleaser? They get real busy whenever the boss comes around. Hey, can I just clue you in on something tonight? God is always watching us. God is always watching us. Whether we try to cut corners, cheat the time clock, do whatever we need to do, God sees all of those things. And then this verse is important because if we liken it in our culture to masters, to our bosses, he says, you do the same things to them and give up threatening making it difficult, being warlords over employees. He says, you treat your employees good, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there's no partiality with him. God looks at everybody in the same fashion, whether we're a worker or we're a boss. And then Paul said this through Timothy, and Timothy said these words in chapter 6 of his first letter. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, everybody turn there. Chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. And all who are under, under the yoke as slaves are to regard... Oh my. <clears throat> Let me start over. <clears throat> all who are under the yoke as slaves are to regor, regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. Those who have believers as masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. Sometimes boys and girls will come to me and they will say, uh, Brother Bailey, would you uh, give me a letter of recommendation? I'm looking for a job. And I want you to know, I take those requests very seriously. I just never write a carte blanche. But here's what I do say about boys and girls who are faithful to God and to Jesus. I tell that employer, I know her, I know him, he will not steal from you. He will come to work on time and he will be a faithful employee. And then if I don't feel that way, I leave that section out. Because see, that reflects on me. And so if we want to be faithful employees and we want to have a job where we'll be rewarded by our bosses, then people must do the Christian thing. We're not looking to cut corners. We're looking to be pleasing to the masters. We're looking to be pleasing to the bosses. Now let's go on. This is not unusual. Titus says these words in chapter 2 verse 9. Urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything. To be well-pleasing. Listen to this. 
not argumentative, not pilfering. That's a good word. You know what that word means? Not stealing from your employer, time or objects. But showing all good faith that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. Be subject to their own masters in everything. And I love this part next. Not argumentative. Have you ever worked with somebody that would just argue with a signpost if they painted it themselves? You know someone like that? The boss says black, they say white. They say sit, they say jump. It's just the opposite. Argumentative, always defying your boss. Let me tell you, your boss doesn't owe you anything except for you to work. And probably someone can replace you. And so it is important for a person to not be a man pleaser, but to be a God pleaser. Not argumentative, not stealing, not pilfering. Years ago, I heard a story about some men that worked up in uh, Michigan at some of the car plants. And every day at quitting time, when the uh, whistle would blow, this man came out and they came through a checkpoint and he had a wheelbarrow and it was full of sawdust every afternoon. And the guards just stopped him every day and said, I want to know what you've got in this wheelbarrow. And he took an instrument and he raked around inside that sawdust. And he said, well, I don't know. He said, it's okay, go ahead and go. And so finally it came time for both of them to retire. And he came to the man and he said, okay, the gig's up. You're leaving today, I'm leaving today. You got to tell me. Every day at quitting time, you come out pushing a wheelbarrow and it's got sawdust in it. And I want to know what it is you've been taking home and stealing from the company. The man looked at him and said, of course, wheelbarrows. You see, it's so obvious. It's so obvious. But it was so hidden. And the man didn't see it because he was looking for car parts or whatever. And so sometimes people do things where they pilfer. They steal from the boss. And let me tell you, God sees that. God sees all of that. And he knows. First Peter chapter 2, Peter goes on and he speaks. And he says in chapter 2, verse 18 of First Peter, that first letter. Chapter 2, verse 18 through 23. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect. Not only to those who are good and gentle. In other words, not just the ones that are always nice to you. And you're not a man pleaser. But also to those who are unreasonable. Maybe you've had an unreasonable boss before. It doesn't matter what you do. You cannot please him or her. And he says, you be a hard worker. Keith and I know a man, Keitha and I know a man in uh, Oklahoma City who worked out at Tinker Air Force Base. And he had a boss that just gave him fits every single day. And you could tell when he had had a bad day because he had come home and he had pinched the skin right above his nose between his eyebrows in frustration all day long and it was just a big red whelp. You know, sometimes that's the boss you're going to have. If you don't like that boss, maybe another job is out in your future. But we have to do what we can and he says, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? Question mark. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, 
He did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. You know, we could camp right here in this passage in 1 Peter 2 for about three weeks, and we could dissect this and talk about each one of them. But I think we're getting the message from the inspiration of the scriptures that we as employees, we as employers, have always got to do the right thing, the Christian thing, and handle employees and employers the right way according to God. Time does not allow a thorough discussion, obviously, of all these verses, but I think it is evident that the Christian employee is drastically different from those employees from the world. That as Christians, we ought to be seen differently than the employee who checks in late and leaves early, who's always looking for a, an out, to get out of doing something. Christ's supremacy is instilled in us as Christians because we are Christians. And employee obedience to superiors, responsible in working, in personal integrity, in business affairs, is upon our shoulders. That's what we do. If we want to have Christ as supreme in our life, it carries through in every facet of life. The employee who wants to have Christ as supreme in our life is challenged to rise above the ordinary, to put in that time, to do what's asked of you, to do, as Jesus said, to go the extra mile. In fact, Christian employee and their motto ought to be, quality is job one. And that was invented long before Ford Motor Company ever even thought of it. Quality is job one. And next, the Christian employee is looking forward to the welcome that we will hear from Matthew chapter 25 and verse 21. Jesus will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, and I will set thee over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Isn't that a great promise? We work faithfully for God. We do what's asked of us as Christians. He says right there, you will be rewarded for that. I want to ask you a question. How long would it take for you to stay on your same job if you didn't get paid? You see, there's something about the reward to us at the end, isn't there? That's the motivator for a lot of people. But when we work for the Lord, we do it with all of our might. We do it and we go above and beyond what we've been asked to do. And we look at that with joy. It is important. The fact that our behavior of a daily job will affect our eternal destiny, it's clear from verses 24 and 25. I know I fall short in many areas, but I will give my dad credit for one thing. He taught three boys and a daughter how to work. And some of you might think, well, Steve, you just work one day a week. Would you come up and follow me for a week? Would you? I'd love to have you come along. Whatever we do, we do for the work of the Lord. And we do it with a passion for Jesus. What kind of person, what kind of Christian are we to the eyes of people who are not Christians? What do people see in us as employees? There was a master of ceremonies once who said to a guest of honor at his retirement dinner, he said these words, As a token of appreciation, we have created the special gold watch to serve as a reminder of your many years with us in the company. It needs a lot of winding up. It's always late. And every day at a quarter to five, it just simply stops working. Would that be the gold watch that you get for where you work? 
Would that be what people say about you? I have a friend who lives out in Midland. Michael and I talk just about every week over Cowboys football. Sometimes we cry, sometimes we rejoice. But I say, Michael, what are you doing? Without fail. Waiting on quitting time. What a life. Really? Just waiting on quitting time? There's more to life than just quitting. There's work to be done, church. There's work to be done in the kingdom. And we can't sit around and let someone else do it. We've got to do our part. And that way we'll be a great employee to God in a great service and a servant of His. To these employees, Paul says that your lives will experience the leavening of the Savior. For the past five weeks, I've been talking about how the leavening of Jesus comes into every facet of our life. He says this in chapter 3, verse 25, and chapter 4, and verse 1. There will be diligence in us to make sure that you are fair and equal toward your workers, that you'll be responsible as a manager for those that labor under you. That's what Jesus says. That's what the Holy Spirit says. And you will recognize the need to be fair and to be equal. And that is how you want the Savior to treat you. And he adds this phrase. Because you also have a master in heaven. You see, that's the big boss. That's the one who sees and watches. One of the greatest joys possible, I believe, is to work in the kingdom of God. To work as a faithful Christian and do the things God would ask us to do. The employer, according to chapter 3, verses 24 through 25, will also be judged by these very same principles. And so not only is it fair for the laborer, but these verses also apply to the person who's doing the hiring. And so let's take a moment and let's draw this together and the lesson will be yours. I think this entire section of talking about wives and husbands and fathers and mothers and children and now as laborers is such a practical section of Scripture, don't you? It covers every facet of our life and who we are as people. And so the Savior's supremacy is certainly one that we ought to take seriously and look at how we are serving Jesus Christ. If the Savior's supremacy is not leavened in our life, in our conduct, of who we are in these relationships, we need to look at chapter 3 and verse 25 because these words apply to us. Let me read it again. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done and that without partiality. In other words, it'll be even Stephen all across the board. And so let's close with a personal exam. You don't need to take out a pencil or paper. You can do this in your head. Let me just pose some questions and the lesson will be yours. Wives, are you performing your role as a Christian woman? Number two, husbands, are you loving your wives with that agape love? That love that goes beyond. And children, teenagers, are you obeying your parents? Do you love them? Do you honor them? And I might add, when's the last time you told mom or dad or both how much you appreciate them sacrificing for you as a child? And then parents, do you provoke your children to wrath or to anger? And then on the positive side, are you disciplining your children in a responsible and godly way. Employees, <clears throat> employees, are you laboring unto the Lord? Do you see your job, your profession as something for God? Are you honest? Are you dependable? Are you energetic? Are you respectful? I read this past week, I, I, I can't make this up. We have a generation of young people now that have a college diploma and they're asking their mothers to go with them to their first job interview. Are you serious? 
Mom, I just don't know what to say. I told you last week that there's a school in the Northeast that has a class in the curriculum that if you would like to take it, it's called How to Talk Small Talk to Adults. This is where we've come as employees and as employers. And so to think about what kind of workers we're going to be, I, I guess the bottom line is it takes a personality and a, and a heartbeat, I guess. It takes someone that can communicate and have a passion for the job they're applying for. And then employers, are you fair? Are you equal? Do you supervise others in the way you would want to be supervised? Do you know that you answer to a master in heaven as an employer? Or do you lord it over the flock? Do you lord it over the workers? That's the question he's asking this section. And I would close tonight by saying we all need to remember that we can never be a success in any of these crucial matters of life until we allow Jesus to have supremacy in our very being of who we are and what we're about. Because Jesus' supremacy touches every facet of who we are. Our theme for 2023 has been Jesus, only Jesus. And now our theme is living for Jesus. Isn't that appropriate when we're here with this subject tonight? that I pray you leave this place and as you start the new year out, go back to school, boys and girls, college, whatever it is, and you go back to work, that you do everything for the will of God and you work as if you are living for Jesus. And I guarantee you, you will never go to work a day in your life if you love what you do. But if you're going to complain and gripe, every day will be a tragedy. And I hope you'll take this tonight and carry it into our lives and think about our work for the Lord and what he's asking us to do and what we're about. Tonight, there may be someone in this audience who's ready to obey the Lord in baptism. You know that you believe in Jesus. You've just never taken the step to confess it. And maybe you're here tonight and you're ready to make that great confession of faith that you believe that Jesus is God's one and only son. And that you would enter into a watery grave of baptism and you'd be laid under the water and be buried with Christ. And then as Christ came out of the tomb, he was raised up and he walked out of that tomb and you are risen. You come up out of that water. You're born again. And the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, that baptism now saves you. So if it's baptism that saves you, all these other things lead up to baptism, but just believing and having intellectual knowledge that I believe in Christ, that's not enough. Just repenting and saying, I'm sorry, that's not enough. Just confessing the name of Jesus, that's not enough. But the key is, you're buried with Christ. You put on Jesus Christ, and you're resurrected out of that watery grave, and now you wear the name of Jesus. Amen? Isn't that a great thought? And then here's the key. We don't talk about this one very much. But then you live your life faithful for Jesus. You live your life faithful for Jesus. Every day of your life. That means every facet as a laborer, as an employee, whatever it is, employer, that you live for Jesus because he's supreme in all that you do. If you're subject to the invitation tonight, will you stand and will you come? We'd be honored to help you tonight.